I want to talk about conservative vector fields. By definition, this means, or one definition, the definition we use in the book, is that a vector field F is conservative if it is the gradient of some function. And the terminology, and the terminology conservative, and this terminology, the, the fact that this is a potential function, those both come from physics, and we'll talk about the connection uh, in some other video. But here we're going to keep it mostly mathematical. So this is a nice definition in one way because it's very explicit, yeah, and it creates a lot of examples. It's essentially a um, in this explicit implicit dichotomy I always use. It's an explicit sort of parametrized definition. It's a great way to create conservative vector fields. It's not a great way to take a random vector field and detect if it's conservative. You have to figure out, is there some mystery potential that it's the gradient of? That's sort of an anti-differentiation step. And we're not even sure if it, if it could be. And, um, and we, we might not even care about what the potential is. And why, do we, why force us to find the potential to figure out if it's conservative or not? So one of the goals is to find an implicit characterization. And there's a few implicit characterizations of different uses. And it's a very, very fundamental concept. So the first thing, so here's an example where I've got the gradient of f, the level curves of f are the green, and then the red arrows are the gradient of that. That's the vector field f. And the first thing to note is that FTC for line integrals automatically applies. This is exactly the kind of vector field to which that applies. And it says that the integral on some curve of f dot dr is just the potential at, um, let's say this curve goes from uh, p to q. Oh, sorry, f of q minus f of p. That's going to be a q. f of the end minus f of the beginning. Okay, And in particular, something I noted in another video is that no matter what the curve is, you're going to keep getting the same answer. And so one way, that's one way to tell if a vector field is not conservative, if you have two um, paths with the same endpoints that give you a different answer. So this is path independence. It's automatically a feature of a conservative vector field. Turns out that if you know this, then in fact you know this. I'm not going to prove that here. Uh, I'll save that for another video or for the book. But um, it turns out that that's actually equivalent to being the gradient of some mystery potential function. That's interesting. Now, one thing is, even though if you're lucky enough to calculate these two paths and find different answers, then obviously it's definitely not a, a conservative vector field. There's no potential. It doesn't look like a great way to actually show that something's conservative because this is an inf a huge infinite set of possible paths that it seems like you'd have to check. Nonetheless, it is actually um, a very, very useful criterion. And it's certainly a very good thing to know about something you already know is conservative. OK. So um, there's a very closely related thing. So that's one thing we're going to, I'll put up a summary of this in a little bit. Don't worry. This blue marker doesn't raise very well. OK, there's another thing. Suppose I have a closed curve. And I'm drawing these all in three dimensions. Most of this stuff, well, all of it has a version in three dimensions. We won't do everything immediately in three dimensions right away. So we have a closed curve. So that's something where the start and end point are the same. So p equals q, essentially. Then if I look at the integral on that curve, and when it's a closed curve and we want to remind ourselves that those are special, which they are very special, we put a little circle here. The closed curve integral, it's not a different kind of integral. It's just reminding us that the answer might well be special. That's just going to be f of p minus f of p, because they're the same. That's 0. So that's going to be for any closed curve. OK, so we've got three things now. We've got this. This is number one. Then we've got two, which is the path independence. And then we've got the three, the closed curve giving 0. So far, we've 
seen that 1 implies 2, and 2 implies 3 all on its own, because all we really used, all we really have to use is 2 implies 3. Here I, I just show that 1 implies 3 using FTC for line integrals. It's easy to show that 2 implies 3, because, think about it for a sec actually, if you want to pause the video, but I'm going to give it away pretty soon. If I know it's path independent, that's all I know about the, the, this vector field, is that any two curves with the same two endpoints give the same integral, then I want to show that this closed curve must give zero. Well, I can compare it to an extraordinarily simple path from P to Q, which is namely just sit there. That is definitely always going to give you a zero integral because the dr is zero, or the velocity is zero when you actually explicitly parameterize it. So that is always going to give zero, and if that gives you the same answer no matter what the, uh, the curve is, it shows that a closed curve is going to be zero. So 2 definitely implies 3 always. So 1 implies 2, 2 implies 3. Okay, and certainly 1 implies 3. Well, I claim it's actually easy to show that 3 implies 2 as well. Because suppose I have two curves with the same endpoints. Notice how little I have to change my picture to create such a, a, a path. Uh, such a. Suppose I have C1 going from P to Q and C2 going from P to Q. And I want to show that the integral over C1, now these aren't closed curves, can I show that those are equal if I just know something about closed curves? Well, I better create a closed curve to be able to use this assumption. This, I'm assuming now, the only thing I'm assuming right now is that closed curves give the integral zero. It's an interesting property on its own. And I claim that that pr implies the path independence. Well, I think you can probably tell me how to create a closed curve. You have to be a little careful about it. We have to take C1, and then we take C2 in the opposite direction. We're going to call that minus C2. Because we, the reason that makes sense is that we know that when we flip the direction of a curve, we get the negative uh, when we apply it to an, a vector line integral of the same vector field. So hey, that in, that's interesting. A way to show that these would be equal is, can I show that the subtraction, the difference of this, is equal to 0? Well, you bet. Because this is the integral over C1 plus the integral over minus C2. And that is the integral over, let's call it, uh, C3. I'm going to write it as C1 minus C2, which just means traverse C1 and then traverse C2 in the opposite direction. Combine them all, hey, guess what? That's a closed curve. And if I assume that that's 0, then indeed these two added together equal 0. And remember that meant the difference of C1 and C2 with their original orientations was 0, and so those were equal. So it's just because of this picture of two paths leading from one endpoint to another can be joined into a closed curve. These are very, very closely related. There's really not a lot of depth to the fact that these are equivalent. Okay, so that's three conditions that are equivalent. But none of them are easy to check in most cases. Again, checking all closed curves to be zero, that's a little easier than checking all curves with all endpoints. So that reduces the task a little bit. But it's still a gargantuan task unless you have some other knowledge of, of how to do things. Well, here's a fourth condition, and it comes directly out of this guy. Now I'm going to write it down for um, two dimensions first, uh, following our textbook. Okay, the 2D, there's going to be a 3D version, don't worry. The 2D version, let me just write this down explicitly. F equals... Um, df dx i plus df dy j. That's what this says explicitly. Okay, so we're going to assume number one, and I'm going to show you that that implies something that is easy to check. What we're going to do is a little bit weird though. We're trying, suppose we start with f, and that is equal to pi plus qj. So that's just giving notation for, for f. And we want to know, is it equal to df dx i plus df dy j? Okay. And so what we're going to do is a little bit odd. We're actually going to take derivatives of p and q. We actually want to know if it can, they can be anti-differentiated. Well, p, just to anti-differentiate p is not hard. We'll, we'll do that in, in, uh, in another video in just a sec. 
Um, just anti-differentiating in principle is not a hard thing to do. Anti-differentiating Q separately is not a hard thing to do. It's to actually anti-differentiate them and get the same function f that works for both of these guys. That's tricky. And the interesting thing is that if we actually take a derivative of p and a derivative of q, that's going to be a check as to whether we can anti-differentiate these guys. So think about some rule about second partial derivatives. Pause the video for a sec if you want and think about if p really were equal to this and q really were equal to this. Is there something about the derivatives of p and q that must be true? Well, what does Clairaut's theorem say? It says that the derivative of p by y, which is d squared f dx dy, is, switch the derivatives, d squared f dy dx, which is none other than the derivative of q with respect to x. So Clairaut's theorem says that for a conservative vector field, we have to have these guys be equal. No mention of f anymore, just these two have to be equal. So the logic is that if such an f exists, even if we don't know what it is, we know that a trace of it lingers in the fact that these cross derivatives, the derivative of p with respect to y, not x, even though it's the x coordinate of the component, and the derivative of q with respect to x have to be equal. The way we can use that first, let's see how we can use that first. It's, it's going to be a little unsatisfying. Again, it's easiest used as a way to show that f is not conservative. If we take dp dy and dq dx and we get that they're different, then there's no way that our vector field f, pi plus qj, could have been conservative. Okay. So let me, I'm going to finally erase this. I'm going to erase everything, actually. Okay. So here's the summary where we are so far. And then in a, another video, I'll just do a couple examples. Statement one, f is conservative. In, it's a gradient vector field, in other words. Statement two, integral of f is path independent. So it only, an integral only depends on the endpoints. Two curves that are different but with the same endpoints will give the same answer. Closed curve integral equals zero. That's for every closed curve. Start and endpoint is the same. C. And four is that um, d p d y equals d q d x. Or I'm going to give a little uh, preview. It turns out that taking d q d x minus d p d y, that combination measures something interesting about a vector field. And it's the condition is that that's zero. What do we know? We know that 1 implies 2 and 2 implies 3, and so certainly 1 implies 3, and we know that 1 implies 4. We also know that 3 implies 2. Okay, It's not super hard to show, I haven't shown it in this video, that 2 implies 1. The path independence shows that it, there is actually, you can actually be sure that there's a, a, um, a gradient, a, a potential out there. So these guys are all equivalent. 1, 2, and 3 are all equivalent to each other. And they all, therefore, imply 4. But unfortunately, that's, and th that's useful. But it's not the, the, the real prize. The real prize would be, suppose I do this. This is an easy thing to check a lot of the time. Suppose I did this. Do I automatically know that it must be conservative? Does 4 imply 1? And the answer is, it depends. Sometimes. Or in other words, if there's an additional hypothesis, a very interesting additional hypothesis, then you can do it. And that'll have to be a tease for later. OK, so that's, I wanted to get that scheme. I like putting these all together in one list, which the book does not, and clarifying the logical relationships. That's main, the main purpose of this video. And we'll do some examples in another shorter video.